So hi, Topaz. Hello, it's good to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for, for meeting with me. So you are a poet and you are the author of Heaven or This, the chapbook, and two full-length collections. I have them here. Um, Poems for the Sound of the Sky Before Thunder and Portrait of My Body as a Crime I'm Still Committing. And you are the editor-in-chief of Half Mystic, which is a journal and a press. Um, is there anything else you want to say to introduce yourself to my audience? That pretty much covers that, I think. Awesome. Oh, I feel like I'm a little nervous. I feel like, honestly, I'll just say this to my audience. I think that Topaz is like one of the most talented poets <laughs> alive today. Sorry, that's like a little bit of like ridiculously high praise, but honestly, I really believe that. So I'm kind of like, I'm very excited. Um, so my first question for you is, you know, kind of a common question. It's like, what are your poetic influences? But I'm particularly interested in like, what you're reading now and also like what influenced you when you were younger because when I read heaven or this like it felt very like modern contemporary it felt like it was like in a poetic tradition in a way that like nothing I was writing as a young teenager was like that so I'm really interested in like what you were reading at that time and like what you're reading now sure so I wrote heaven or this when I was 16 um or I wrote it when I was about 15 I published it when I was 16 um and at that point, um, I was reading a lot of uh, work by like Richard Sykin, Dana Smith. Um, I was a big fan of Sylvia Plath, uh, Louise Glick. Um, who else? I've always been a fan of Atwood. Um, I really started, I mean, I've always loved books. And so I've been kind of a reader from when I was a kid, um, but I really only started reading poetry when I was probably about 13 or 14. Um, and that was mostly because I didn't really see poetry as being super relevant to me um, when I was younger. Um, and I only kind of got into modern and contemporary poetry when I was in my teens. And that's, I think, when my really serious interest in poetry um, began. So um, that's kind of where it began and that's where it started. Um, and then right now you can see I've got like my little stack of books over there. <laughs> um, I love i actually just got a tattoo of down tarts the goldfinch which is uh like my all-time favorite book which i read a couple of years ago now but like continues to influence so much of the way i think and the way that i write um i've been really interested in um books about disability justice and the disability revolution um so i just finished disability visibility which is a collection of essays edited by alice wong um which was wonderful um other than that, uh, I love Kave Akbar's new book. Um, Paige Lewis is also a, a huge fan of hers, or sorry, of theirs. Um, and uh, I'm, I am taught, I, Monica Yoon was one of my professors um, last semester, and I didn't really uh, know much of her work before I was taught by her. Um, but in her class, I really got into reading her work and I love the way that like she has such a long kind of history as a poet. Um, I love how we can like see her growth so clearly over the course of her work. Um, that's really exciting. That's really inspiring to me. Um, and not just books, like I, I love film. Um, I've been watching more TV lately. I love music. Um, and so I'm really inspired by like so many different um, art forms and so many different kind of uh, creations in the world, not just books. Awesome. So wait, so um, can I ask that Kava Akbar book? Is that the one that's coming out in the fall? Have you read the one that's... Sorry, so no, th th this is not Pilgrim Bell. Um, oh, okay. I have only read like excerpts like on socials and stuff. And I think it's been like published in The New Yorker and things like that. Um, but I, sorry, I said new because I read his books like in order. And so I just finished mm. um, Calling Wolf a Wolf. Oh, yeah. um, I think it's a couple of years old now, but I, I just finished it like a month ago um, and I loved it. And actually, Kav is another author who I think it's so cool because you can really see like the progression of his style over the course of his chapbooks and his um, and his poetry. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm so excited for Pilgrim Bow. Um, Me too. I, I just like I have that pre-ordered. So I was like, oh, did you get an arc or something? Like, <laughs> do you have the inside scoop? Uh, yeah, I'm so excited for that book. Yeah, he's amazing. Um, so yeah, that kind of transitions nicely into my next question, which is like, I know that the sort of origins of Half Mystic had to do with like music and the connection. So I'm a poet and a musician as well. And I can really, I mean, it feels like inseparable genres of art to me, but I was wondering if you could talk about like how they connect for you. Sure. So um, 
I started off kind of my career uh, very much doing both um, equally. Um, and so I was both a kind of writer and a musician. Um, and like you mentioned, those have pretty much always been fairly inseparable for me. Um, when I was about 15 or 16, I was diagnosed with an illness uh, that essentially uh, made it so that I couldn't play music anymore. Um, and I played piano, guitar, and I sang. Um, so it was it was a pretty big part of my life. Um, and so, yeah, I started Half Mystic um, like a year later. Um, I think just because I needed a way to stay connected to that part of me um, and to sort of still have um, an artistic craft outside of just the writing element, which I adore and which is so important to me, but also can't be the only thing in my life. Um, and so Half Mystic was really a way for me to stay sharp, um, expand kind of the, the work that I was doing such that it didn't feel boring or didn't feel like it was kind of getting stale or stagnant. Um, and, you know, if I had the choice, obviously, I, I would not upgrade it half my sake because I would still be playing music. Um, but uh, given the circumstances, um, I think it's, I was very fortunate that it kind of worked out the way it did. Um, and there were, you know, people were so kind and, you um, like just created such a wonderful community out of it uh, that really feels like it straddles the border, I think, between um, poetry and, and prose and music and art also um, in a way that is really, really exciting. Um, and I don't really see happening in a lot of other journals. Um, and I hope kind of we're pushing more towards that interdisciplinary form. So I've read, I read a few articles of other interviews you've done, and it sounds like you historically have been pretty disciplined about your writing. like in the sense that I mean like not waiting for inspiration or just kind of having like a practice. Um, and I kind of, that's my approach as well. So I'm interested in that because, and I think it's from my music background. Like I think of writing sometimes it's like just practicing with my goal of just getting better, not necessarily like needing to be inspired by a brilliant idea. It also makes me really sad. Sometimes I hear people say like they love writing but they feel like they don't have anything to say. Like I don't have something to say, which makes me sad because I feel like I feel like everyone has something to say and I just don't wait until I have things to say. I just like ramble in a notebook as a thing I do all the time. So I was just wondering like what um, what your writing process or routine, if there is one, like looks like these days. So um, at the moment, I am in a kind of weird place, I guess, with my routine and that um, I'm not, well, I, have, I have a new book coming out um, next year, uh, next May and pre-orders are open now, uh, which is very exciting. So um in terms of like with that book it's, it's a poetry book and and the writing process itself the writing is pretty much done um we're really in the editing stage um and we're working towards kind of polishing and, and revising um and so with that i haven't really been writing a lot of poetry um just because so much of my like poetic arsenal has just been like tied up in editing and making it better and making it pretty um, and waiting for that to sort of reach its completion. But in the meantime, I've, I've actually been doing a lot of prose, which is very new for me. Um, I just finished um, writing a column for Half Mystic, uh, which is a thing I do annually. Um, and those are always like, I don't do a lot of long form prose. Um, so those are always kind of hard for me. Um, and they're a challenge that I, that I love to tackle every year. Um, so I just finished that. And then I'm working on a novel um, just because I wanted to do something that was like totally different um, and with the new, the new book is called So Stranger and it's like it was such a hard book for me to write um, but I think you know after that was out of me I was kind of like let's just do something that is new and that doesn't feel like I'm just digging deeper and deeper and deeper because um, I think that's how, that's how it felt with this book um, so the novel is like a thing where I have totally new writing process because I've never really written something long like this before. Um, and so I'm really like feeling it out as I go uh, in a way that just feels like really fresh and um, scary, but also like in, in a very beautiful um, and very almost intimate way. Um, and in a way that like, it reminds me why I started. And that's, I think the the point of anything that I'm doing. Okay, so you mentioned Louise Glick, who I, I've been reading. I, I haven't even gotten through this, Proofs and Theories. It's like very heavy. It's, most of it's going over my head. But um, I want to read a quote that like made me think about how I feel about your work, which says, within the discipline of criticism, nothing is more difficult than praise. To speak of what you love, not admire, not know to be good, 
not find reasonably interesting, not feel br briefly moved by or charmed by, to speak of such work is difficult because the natural correlatives of awe and reverence are not verbal. I just, I read that the, the other day and I had this interview planned with you and I was like, that is exactly <laughs> like, I tried to make a video about um, portrait of my body as a crime I'm still committing, but I had like nothing intelligent to say because I was just like, it's good, you guys, it's just good. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but I can say like a few things about what I like about your poetry. I mean, a lot of the subject matter just speaks to me a lot. It's like girlhood, mental health, like sapphic relationships, all this wonderful stuff. <laughs> um, it feels very multi-sensory to me, which makes sense with the music ties and everything. Like there are some really like descriptions that kind of blend into like synesthesia with sound and, and like all five senses kind of blending together, which I think is really cool. Um, and for me, what I'm always looking for is like this sweet spot where it feels poetic and like skillful, but it lets me in. Like, I don't feel like it's, your work is like pretentious or I feel like I, I understand it, which also might have to do with just relating to the subject matter. But I was just kind of wondering like what you look for as a, as a reader of poetry. I know you, you mentioned a bunch of influences, but I, I guess I mean like in terms of style or like what, what you look for. Well, that's a hard question. Sorry, um, it's kind of tricky. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I don't know that I look for anything specific in terms of uh, the work that I gravitate towards, possibly because I'm always interrogating why I like what I like, because I think the reason why I like what I like often has to do with my upbringing, which was very much privileged and the school that I go to, which is a very kind of elite and white and rich institution. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm an expat, like I am Singaporean, but I'm also American, um, but I'm also Indian. And so like having that, those three cultural backgrounds are, is a very, very privileged thing that I think not a lot of people get. And so when I'm thinking about the work that I'm drawn to, I think art is always political, but also the way that we consume art is political. Um, and so I always want to be thinking about like, if I'm, if I'm naturally interested in a certain type of poetry, what does that say about what I'm comfortable with and what I've trained myself to, uh, accept as normal. Um, and I don't, I don't think I, I ever want to allow myself to sort of fall back into that, those same patterns. Um, because I think that if I start doing that, then that makes me complacent and that makes me, um, that gives me an excuse not to constantly be, fighting for a more inclusive sense of what poetry is and what art is and what literature is. Um, Cause I don't, I don't think that there is any bad poem. Um, and I can say that and still have poems that I like and dislike. But even when I dislike a poem, I always want to go back to like, is it actually, is it me who dislikes it? Or is it the way that I was raised? And is it the way that, you know, my literary voice was cultivated, which was in a very specific way um, and which, you know, has its own blind spots. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that means that I can't have an opinion because uh, I certainly do, but uh, I always want to make sure that my opinion is situated in the context of a world that sees it and vice versa. Um, because otherwise it can turn into a thing where I believe that my opinion is the truth. And that is just never a hole that I want to fall down, which is kind of a cop-out answer. I'm sorry, but oh, it's kind that's, of that's actually way more like interesting and deep than what I would, than <laughs> I would have said, which is very specific things, but like, yeah, you've given me a lot to think about in my own reading and yeah, it is such a, like the publishing world in particular is such a political space of like who literally who gets to have a voice like that's it's you know we all have to like think about that in what we are consuming and you've given me a lot to like think about myself okay so i have to mention how old you are <laughs> which i will be honest i feel kind of uncomfortable about this question so wait you're 21 right now is that is that how old? okay and so you have like these age-based accolades to your name of like being the youngest person to do certain things. And I get like, I feel bad even mentioning this because well, one thing I want to make clear is that like, I think your work is amazing. And I would think that no matter how old you are, it's not like amazing because of how young you are. I, I first read portion of my body as a crime is still committing. And I went like backwards in time, um, which like someone just posted this on Goodreads and I read the title and I was like, Ooh, 
that's a good title. I bet I would like that. Um, and then I looked you up and was like, wait, no, <laughs> 21 and you have two other collect. So anyway, um, but I want to know like how you feel about that because I can imagine, like, I just actually can't imagine what that would be like. And I, um, I imagine there's like good things and possibly bad things about it. Like, I just don't know how it would feel to have this. It actually feels like maybe a lot of pressure, you know? Because what I would say about you is I'm like, oh, I'm so excited that you have like this lifetime of more work ahead, of, which feels like a huge amount of pressure to put on. So anyway, sorry, very rambly question, but anything you want to say about that would be interesting to me. It's a great privilege and it's also a great burden. And I think those two things can coexist um, in the sense of, you know, I'm 21, I've been writing and publishing my work since I was 13, which is literally a third of my life. Um, and like, I don't know, I, I was, I don't, I don't know if you know Blythe Baird, who is a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, she is a press mate of mine at, at Button Poetry and she was on my adored I, I loved her work long before we actually became friends but um it was like I think this was a few years ago um when I was in her city for the summer and um I went to her place and we were talking about she she is uh, basically a viral slam poet and um so much of her work is stuff that she published when she was like 18 and 19 and I, when I met her I think she was like 23 um, and she hadn't published in like years at that point. And, and we were we were talking about like becoming symbols at like such a young age. And the other thing with life is she got her started as an actress. And so I think that's really kind of the industry that she came from and that's really how she got into performing. Um, but it struck me how she was really the first person I ever talked to who um, understood uh, what it was like to like, just like be so young and represent so much. And to have that be the most beautiful thing in the world, because it's it's what you've been working towards, you know, like it's it's something where like, of course you want it, otherwise you wouldn't be in this industry. Um, and yet at the same time, it's like, I walk down the street and I have to look good because people are gonna be taking photos of me. <laughs> and like, I ha I can't ever be, you know, I remember like, back when I was home, I was home last summer and I'm from Singapore, I was home last summer and um, I was like with my sister who's 16 and uh, like my best friend and we were like walking like just down the street and it's like every time I would go, I would go out with her, it would be like somebody would stop me and be like, hey, can I get a photo with you? Can I get an autograph? Whatever. Um, which is, you know, fun the first couple of times it happens, but you know, the more it happens, it's like, the more it's like, I am with my family right now. Can I please be a sister instead of being a figure? Um, and I just remember being very struck by the fact that I didn't have really that conversation until I was probably 19 or 20 um, with someone who had really gone through it before. So it, it, it feels like something that is not really talked about. Um, I think in, in the, the literary communities and in at least my poetic communities, um, because there is this culture of like, if you have any measure of success, so few people have that, like that's so special. And, and it's, you know, such a wonder and such a privilege to um, even be in that position. Um, but it's also tough. Uh, <laughs> and it's also kind of, uh, I've really had to create boundaries for myself where like I allow myself to be a kid sometimes um, and I allow myself to, like not have to represent the entirety of my work um, and just like go out with my friends um, and, you know, not always be on and not always be sort of like diplomatic and, and willing to uh, engage in this sort of power dynamic of engaging with like fans um, when I'm literally just like trying to be in the world. Um, so it's, I think it's a process. Um, and I think that as I've gotten older, not that I'm like a sage or whatever, but <laughs> I think as I've like left my teens particularly, um, I've gotten more comfortable with um, acknowledging and sort of being in the spotlight. Uh, because before, when I was younger, it, it was something that felt so uncomfortable for me. Um, and as I've gotten older, I, I think I've, I've, I've grown into it a little bit more, but it is always something where I have to negotiate with myself constantly. 
of what role am I playing today? Um, and in, in the best of worlds, there is no difference between who I am as a public figure versus who I am in private. But in the world that we live in right now, I really do need to like have those boundaries. Um, and so it's really important to me to be able to switch off and be able to, you know, turn off the internet and not go outside and like be as lost sometimes um, and not have every single moment broadcasted in a way that I think that when I was younger, I really felt the pressure to always be representing and always be performing. Well, that's good. I'm glad that it's gotten, I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily say better, but like you have practice with it. And But yeah, I imagined that that was not like a strictly wonderful thing. I just, I, I can't truly imagine what it would be like, but I think about this all the time, you know, I'm like, oh, I hope my YouTube channel blows up. And then I'm like, no, I don't. That would be such a burden. I don't know. So I guess this, this is related to the last one. Um, and I'm asking this for pretty selfish reasons. That's like, are you ever afraid of the the topics themselves that you're writing about? And like, it, it's just so vulnerable to publish at all. Like I have two voices in my head. One is like, oh, what if no one ever reads this? And one is like, but what if they do, <laughs> you know? And so I just like, I find your work to be really inspiring, like poetically, but also like, again, yeah, having put yourself out there in that way so young, I, I feel like I guess I wonder, has, has that part gotten easier or, um, yeah. I think it's gotten harder almost um, because like when I was, when I was younger and put like, have read this, what you read was like my first, I, I had published before then, um, but I hadn't published anything long and I hadn't published anything that had really like blown up and having read this was the first thing that I, that I put in the world that was just like went incredibly viral and everyone was reading it and, you know, like people, started like knowing me by by this chapbook um that was so hard um because before then it, it kind of felt like I was putting I was putting the work in the world but no one was really listening and so there was very much a kind of safety and uh, there was a kind of security and understanding like I was putting these really deeply intimate and, and vulnerable things kind of in public um but it still felt like a deeply private endeavor because it was a there was a little circle of people who I felt like I knew and they were not my friends they were readers but um it felt like those people were very um like gentle with me and gentle with my work um and when having or this like just you know went wild um this started something where like that it's a book of love poems which is like maybe the most like vulnerable possible form um and there were people who were like this is trashed <laughs> like I can't believe that like this person would put this in the world um and it's hard when you're 16 uh and you're kind of you know getting those criticisms um and I think the older I've gotten and I've just been like beyond lucky um that like my books have reached such wonderful audiences um, but with those audiences, of course, comes critics. Um, and so I remember like with Portrait, uh, which is the latest book that I have, like it got rejected by so many publishers. Um, and it felt like such a personal thing uh, where like this was like a book that was so important to me and, you know, had so much of myself inside of it. And I knew, you know, it was winning awards. I knew people liked it. I knew readers wanted it. Um, but like no one liked it not to take a chance on it and so it, it i think it almost gets harder the older i get because it feels like so many more eyes are on me um and i say that but at the same time i think that there's also such joy in that because it's like the stuff that i that i write i mean i was thinking about this with um the new column that that i just published a couple of weeks ago um which is about like explicitly about mental illness and I haven't written anything like prose wise about mental illness in a really long time um I, I I published that and I was just thinking like this would be so much easier like when I was 14 or 15 when it, it really felt like there were like 10 people reading and now I publish and it's like okay I know there's gonna be like 10,000 people reading and like there's there's such a difference there but also the number of people that reaches and the number of people that helps and the number of people who feel less alone. Um, I just think about like when I was 14 or 15 and like first being diagnosed with all these things 
if I had read something like this personal and I saw work from, you know, a queer young Singaporean Indian American writer under the age of 20 at the time, like, and, and I saw her like so explicitly putting work about illness and work about healing and work about like heart topics in the world, um, I would have just felt so much more secure in where I was in my own journey. And so I always try and return to that. And I always try and realize like, this is not about me. And like, I, th I think it started about me. And I think it started where like, this is something that I need to do for myself. But the more my audience grows, the more I'm thinking like, this is for the people who don't feel like they have a voice. Um, and that's the most important thing. And that's really who we're trying to reach. And I, and I, I hope always that that kind of drowns out the voice of the critics or the people who don't believe in whatever I'm making. That seems like a really good way to kind of drive yourself like through those fears and know that like, I mean, I feel like you have every right to self protect yourself in whatever way you can, but I, I get what you're saying that like, maybe it's, it's bigger than you uh, at this point. Um, that kind of, you kind of touched upon something else I wanted to ask, which is, about like self publishing versus traditional publishing. So I didn't even notice like I read, okay, portrait, I have it here, the the covers like really gorgeous. And I saw the the contest wins. And I just like assumed it was a traditionally, I didn't even look and then I looked and I was like, Oh, is this this was self published, right? Or was it? Yeah, which I did <laughs> not even I honestly think that like having the contest wins on the front, I was like, Oh, okay. I am. Um, so I'm just really interested. And again, it's another kind of selfish question because I'm like someone who is really intrigued by both realms um, of like traditional publishing and self-publishing. So I just, I'm curious anything you have to say about like those choices and um, you know, what motivates them or like what, you know, pros and cons or whatever. I love self-publishing. Um, and I think self-publishing comes under a lot of flack, particularly these days. Um, because a lot of people can think that self-publishing leads to a lower quality of content. Um, and, and I got that worry a lot when I was, you know, talking with my, with my circle, when I was saying, okay, what if I just self-publish this book that's really important to me? It's not going to pick it up anywhere. What if I just put the book and did it? Um, and so many people were like, well, be careful, because if you do that, people see self-publish, they're going to think, okay, this is not a very good book. Um, and, and I was, I was stressed about that for a bit. And um, I, I, remember so clearly I was in, this was, this was over my gap year. So it was the year after I graduated high school. Um, and I was, I was traveling uh, and I was having a wonderful year except for this book, which like, like I could, I, it was like such an important thing to me and no one wanted it. And I remember I was traveling alone and I was alone for about six weeks and I had just a lot of time to think. And it was, you know, I was in a foreign country. Um, and I was journaling a lot. I was thinking a lot. I was reading a lot. Um, and I didn't know what was holding me back from self-publishing because I thought about it. And at that point I had Heaven or This and uh, Thunder out and Heaven or This had done better than Thunder and, and uh, Heaven or This was self-published versus Thunder was published with a traditional press. And so objectively, it's like business-wise, it makes sense to self-publish, but something in me was like held back from that. Um, I just remember like I think I was in like a restaurant in like London or something um and I like went into the bathroom I looked at myself in the mirror and I just thought this is your ego talking like this is not actually about the art this is about your ego the reason why you don't want to self-publish is because you think you're too good for that um and I and I was just like in this like public bathroom like having this epiphany um and uh and I walked outside and I went to the table and I pulled out my laptop and I um, texted my best friend and I said I'm going to self-publish this book uh, because I kind of came to the understanding that I was putting I was putting my ego over my art um, and that's such an easy thing that's such an easy trap that so many of us can fall into because we want to have this identity of artists and we want to be taken seriously as artists um, and I was so like wrapped up in this thing of like, I've already traditionally published with that should go backwards to self-publishing. Um, and, and it was never actually about the art. And, and you know, I, I, I just thought about it and it was like, if I want this book to reach the people that, that need it, 
um, clearly it's not clicking in the industry right now. Clearly the market doesn't want it. I believe in this book and I believe that it's a good book and I believe that it needs to be in the world. Um, and, uh, and I announced it like a week later that I was not publishing. And uh, it was it was just something where, you know, when I announced it, all the readers were like, oh, like, this is wonderful. No one asked who, who the press was. Um, and, and I think also to be fair, part of that is I have the great, great, great portion of having an existing audience. And I had, you know, previous books, I had kind of a platform. And so of course that does factor into it, but if the book is good, who cares how it gets into the world? Um, and I really try and like stick with that, particularly because like, you know, I, I run, a, I run a small press. Um, and some of the most daring and innovative and important, work that I've ever read has been published by indie presses and some of it has been published by Half Mystic. And even though it wasn't published by like Penguin, um, like it's still worthy of existing in the world. Um, and so I think the more that I think about it, the more I think that there's a lot of elitism um, in the industry of what is good enough to be published um, and what the industry believes should be quote unquote chosen. But I read people like um, like Ruby Carr or people like Amanda Lovelace, who are, you know, people that I've interacted with a little bit. I don't know that I would consider them like my friends, but we are kind of acquaintances, and and we talk about like the industry, and it's like people like that who who have helped so many people and whose work has touched so many. They they wouldn't be here if not for self publishing. I think that's really special, and I think like. Um, just because the industry doesn't believe that that work is worthy of being published, that doesn't mean it shouldn't still be in readers' hands. Um, and so self-publishing just gives people, gives artists power. Um, and if you take away sort of the, the baggage that comes along with, like people think self-publishing is for newbies or people who are like amateurs or whatever, um, there is some exciting work that's being self-published the same way that there's exciting work being published by small indie presses and also by huge big five presses. Um, and so taking away sort of the, the elitism that comes with the label has been really important for me moving forward. That's so interesting. I, I feel like I've realized this recently and it was, I was listening to a podcast and they were interviewing Hugh Howie. I haven't really read, he's a sci-fi writer. I haven't really read his work. But he said um, he had like a similar situation. He posted a short story. It went viral and he had an audience and he decided to self-publish and um, made a lot more money that way than he probably would have if he didn't because he didn't have to, you know, uh, cut the publishers a check or whatever. And he said something that's really stuck with me. He basically said, like, people say that self-publishing is a vanity project, but for a lot of people, like traditional publishing is the, the vanity project because that's that voice inside of you that's like, no, I need to win the stamp of approval. I need to like, yeah, to get them to, to pick me. And yeah, that's just been stuck in my head ever since. And like, not to say neither one necessarily is, but it's like, you gotta like listen to, yeah, where your ego is and where, um, like what is the motivation? Because there's good good reasons for, for either path, but you got to think about like, what are those reasons? So thank you for sharing that. That's so interesting. So I think I'm just going to ask one final, hopefully fun question, which is um, what would your advice be for a young poet? Or I guess I could say like a young artist, really anyone like putting their work out there like that. I get asked this question so often and I never have a good answer for it uh, because I think that most young writers I know wouldn't listen to me for good reason, um, because the best young writers that I know are doing their own thing and refuse to listen to anyone. I know when I was younger, I would never listen to some old guy tell me what to do. <laughs> um, but that said, one thing that I wish I at least had, had known when I was younger is um, there's a tendency often to want to buy into things like competitions and things like um, scholarships and uh I'm, I'm mentoring a teen writer right now who uh calls it the teen writing industrial complex which i think is hilarious um and and that and that sort of industry which it very much is is deeply americanized it's incredibly misogynistic it privileges the rich um it doesn't allow for voices that are outside of the norm and that are outside of um what quote unquote modern poetry is supposed to sound like. I think 
what I wish I had done when I was younger was been a lot more skeptical of what those contests and what those um, scholarships and fellowships and mentorships and opportunities actually offer. Um, I think that we all have, when we're younger, we all have kind of this need to uh, be liked and this need to be chosen because, you know, we we don't always believe in ourselves as artists. Uh, and, and that's hard when you're when you're a teenager and particularly in a world that tells you that poetry is not worth anything or is not kind of a viable or valuable career path. Um, but what I would want to say to young writers is the work that you're creating is valuable on its own. It doesn't need to be changed to fit the needs of judges or uh, adults or people who are <laughs> people who want to give you prizes for sounding like them um and like the same way I, you know i was talking about how some of the most exciting work that i know is being published by indie presses also some of the most exciting work i know is being published by teams um and that work doesn't always get the recognition that it necessarily deserves because sometimes uh it can it can feel like uh, nobody's listening unless your voice fits the traditional canon and fits the mold of what uh, poetry today is meant to sound like, but that's actually not how good art is made. Um, and so I would, I would really say to young writers, like, don't think about what the industry wants. Um, think about what excites you as an artist and kind of focus on um, creating a craft that makes you excited to get up in the morning and makes you excited to like put more words on the page. Because otherwise it just turns into a thing where like you're doing this for external awards um, and that's not really sustainable. And if that's really the reason why you're you're kind of in this game, um, then I there are there are better industries for you to get into that are gonna that are gonna bring you a lot more fame than poetry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like do it do it for the art and uh, do it like even despite the fact that um, it might not always be the most popular choice. The work is valuable because it's yours. Um, and that's, I think, a skill and a knowledge that I wish I had had earlier. Wow. So yeah, I don't know if I quite qualify as a young writer anymore. I'm, I'm kind of young, but I, uh, I, <laughs> I'm going to be thinking about that advice for sure. So before you go, I want everyone who's watching to know that you have a lot of things that they can look into. You have a website, you have these books that I've mentioned um, that can be ordered. You have a Patreon and pre-orders are up for your next your next book, which I will be pre-ordering. I'm very excited. So yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so, so much for sitting down with me. This was really, really fun.